confines of these parameters. For uh, Kildonan St. Paul. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'm uh, very glad to be speaking to this pressing issue that has uh, really got Canadians glued to their televisions, that the convoy has been really all over Ottawa and across every major city in Canada, and we've even seen it spread to other countries around the world. So I'm very, very glad that after two long years of division on COVID that we are finally beginning to debate uh, this important matter in this historic house of democracy. Uh, I did want to begin my remarks by, uh, actually I forgot to say this right off the bat, but I'll be splitting my time with the member from Megantic at Les Rables. Um, so I, I did want to begin my speech a little bit about talking about what kind of politician I think you have to be to to make a difference in this place. And I think every MP in this house has a bit of a different style. And uh, when I first came here, I, I really, for me, I wanted to be a bridge builder. And that really came from when where I grew up and where I went to university. I grew up in a small farming community in rural Manitoba to four generations of Canadian farmers. So I had very entrenched uh, rural prairie upbringing and values. And then I went to university at McGill University in Montreal, a very prestigious, uh, elite, uh, liberal sort of university, and I met kids from all over the world with all different political views and worldviews, and really got an incredible experience learning about how other people think about the world. And uh, I did find that often while parties will disagree and someone will say, I'm a staunch liberal, I'm a staunch conservative, or I'm a staunch NDP, there's actually a lot more that we have in common. And something that I found that all parties, I, I believe, at their core have in common is that they, they do believe that all Canadians and all people of of this world de deserve to be treated with dignity, compassion, and respect. And so that's how I approach these divisive issues that we as MPs encounter all the time, and they're never get difficult, or they're never easy to talk about. They're very difficult issues. And I, I look to try to build a bridge uh, so that we can come together as Canadians and agree on a peaceful path forward. And that's how I've been trying to look at the very divisive situation in Ottawa right now. And uh, what I'd really like to see is a prime minister who calls for national unity. Last week I spoke in the House about a lot of the division that we're seeing in the country between east versus west, rural versus urban, and uh, particularly now during the pandemic. And we have heard so much trauma from our constituents. If there's any member in this House that does not believe Canadians have been through trauma these past two years, they clearly have not been doing their job and listening to their constituents, Mr. Speaker. It has been horrific, the things that I've heard. We hear young children who are so depressed they don't want to eat. Eating disorders are through the roof. We've heard seniors and elderly in our care homes who've opted for medical assistance in dying rather than live one more month through isolation in care homes. I have had widowed elderly women call and cry to me on the phone of how lonely they are and they don't want to go on. I've had grown men who've called me crying because their businesses are falling apart. We know divorces, abuse at home, alcohol dependency, drug dependency, all of these terrible things are up in our country because people are just trying to cope and are breaking down. So from that perspective, I don't really see what's going on across the country is all that surprising. To me, it seems like an eruption of something that's been simmering of pain and trauma and frustration for two long years. And governments have not been listening to that pain and trauma despite having rapid tests, vaccines, and all different types of tools and scientific knowledge. Governments have repeatedly, repeatedly relied on harsh lockdown measures and divisive mandates to control this virus. Meanwhile, we are seeing a Prime Minister who today got up in the House and again, again othered Canadians who don't agree with him. This is a man for six years said diversity is our strength, but if anybody doesn't agree with everything he says, you're in the bad books and you don't get a chance to be heard. You don't have a right to be heard. Hey. And again, last week I brought I brought to the floor of the House of Commons remarks he had said during that $600 million unnecessary election. He said so many times before he called that election, vaccines for all those who want them, vaccines for all those who want them. It's a choice. He said that repeatedly, must have said it a thousand times. And then with da within days of calling that election, he was yelling into a microphone at a liberal rally that you have the right not to get vaccinated, but you don't have the right to sit next to someone who is. So. To me, that doesn't really seem like someone, what did he say in his remarks today? He said, 
This is not a fight against one another. It's a fight against the virus. Those remarks, Mr. Speaker, suggest very different, very different. So when it comes to an election and scoring political points and winning votes, the prime minister is very happy to divide Canadians and pit right. them against each other for their different personal health views. I, for one, am sick and tired of seeing politicians use this as an evil wedge tool to rip Canadian families apart. I can't tell you how much anger and tears I saw in the last election. That was six months ago. And now it's even worse. Neighbours won't talk to each other. I mean, Christmas family dinners. I mean, even if there wasn't lockdowns during Christmas, it's almost a nightmare to get families in the same room now. If there's one person who doesn't share their views, I mean, it's, it's a nightmare. Colleagues at work. Again, last week I shared the story of a social worker, a young mom I met during the pandemic uh, on her front step. Uh, she was uh, sharing with me a story that she got Hero of the Year Award last year. And this year, she, and she had gone above and beyond to help people during a pandemic. Before there was vaccines, she stepped up, Hero of the Year at her job. And now she said no one would talk to her and she was going to get fired because of one personal health choice that she made. As much as others tried, there was no convincing this woman otherwise. And I just, I don't know how public health officials and public officials get behind policies that do that to Canadians. We are one of the most vaccinated countries in the world. And this government continues to use it as a bludgeon to get people to submit to their policies. It's, it, I've never thought that entering politics two and a half years ago at a federal level, we would see a, a government that was so keen to divide Canadians on something so deeply personal. And as I've said before, and I'll say it again, I denounce any hateful and violent act outside. Whoever is up to no good, who's ever up to that kind of mischief and that kind of hateful rhetoric and those actions, shame on you. But what I'm seeing across the country is people mobilizing because their governments have not listened to them for two years. They've been experiencing trauma for two years and no one is listening to them. And so what choice do they have left? These people have all emailed their MPs. They've called them. They've been turned down by their MPs. I'm sure there's members uh, of the public from Papineau, from the member, the prime minister's riding, who've reached out, who have a different perspective on this, who've been traumatized and fired from their jobs for a personal health choice. There are millions of Canadians, millions of them, that have been deeply ostracized from society. And when you don't listen to those people, they mobilize. And we've seen protests across this country for, for over a century. And rightfully so, we have the right to peacefully protest. And I would ask the protesters outside that they do their best and stay vigilant to stay peaceful. But we are seeing other governments around the world step up with lower vaccination rates and say, look, we hear you, you've been traumatized, we're moving forward. Here's the deadline. This is the plan. No more mandates, no more masks, no more distancing. You can travel, you can live your life, you can hug each other again. Here's the date. This is the plan. Here's the thresholds. None of that in Canada. Absolutely none of that from the Prime Minister. People have been traumatized and they're mobilizing because they need some hope. They need somebody in this house of privilege to come down from our ivory towers and say, okay, little people, we hear you. So sorry we've traumatized you for two years. We're going to step up and we're going to give you some hope. Here's a deadline. The member opposite is laughing. The people in this house are incredibly privileged. You've kept, pardon me, that member has kept his job. Thousands of Canadians have lost their job. And he's laughing about his, privilege, his own privilege. What has he done to serve members that are marginalized during this pandemic in his community, Mr. Speaker, but laugh at them in this House of Commons? Shame on that member. I would, I would ask this government to do everything they can. I asked them this two years ago in the House. Go to other countries, see what they're doing. What are the best practices? How is it that other de highly advanced, developed nations like the UK, Ireland, the Netherlands, Norway, Denmark, Germany, Sweden, Switzerland, how, the United States, how is it that they have all the same tools we have, they have all the economic resources we have, they've done, their citizens have done all the work and made all the sacrifices. Why is it that those citizens get a plan for hope? of when we get back to normal, when we get our lives back, when the people outside, you think they want to be here, Mr. Speaker? Those people don't want to be here. They want to be working. But that right was taken away from them. When is there going to be a plan from this Prime Minister? When is there going to be compassionate leadership to say, this is, when, this is it, you've done the work, here's the tools, we're moving forward. 
Our public health doctors have told us as well, it's time to move forward. It's time to revisit these harsh mandates and divisive policies. So Mr. Speaker, I will just end on this. And I, I, I'm very passionate about this. I think we all are from our different perspectives. But I will say I will continue to be a bridge builder, to reach out, to try to understand where others are coming from. And I would, I would, it would just be incredible if we could see members of the Liberal Party, the Prime Minister, do the same. Time to build a bridge, Mr. Speaker. In